we've come down the hill from St. Peter's Church and from the preacher's stone there, the sermon stone, traveling across the trails. Now we've come down into the site of, I mean, I have to tell you, Ross, when we were climbing up the hill here, I didn't know what to expect. I thought no, we were going to come to really. the top of a mound and that would be it. But instead, we walked into the site of the earliest known Christian church in the world. of early Christians didn't end when, with the crucifixion of Jesus. There were still the others in the group, people such as close family and Joseph of Arimathea who took him down from the cross. They had to find somewhere to go and with the Romans persecuting them, if you look at a map of this period, the whole Mediterranean was within the Roman Empire. To leave the Roman Empire you'd have to go outside this and the natural place was Britain. Especially when you look at the earlier records of the migrations, such in 500 BC, where some of these people, Hebrews, sometimes referred to as lost tribes, came to settle in Wales and became part of, or actually became, the Cymru, as Wales is still known. So if you're fleeing from the persecution of the Romans, the natural place to go would be where your kinsmen were, outside the Roman orbit, and that was in South Wales. And the stories there, the records, the British records, and many others, Shall Joseph Arimathea set up his first church here in 37 AD, which would make it the first Christian church in the world. This is a site we visited with uh, Dr. Stephen Pigeon, who's across from uh, Canada, where he has a very successful channel. And he comes from a very different approach, where he goes through the Hebrew side of things, the Hebrew records, and follows the history of the early Christians that way. Uh, there are a few areas where we might have... Uh, you know, different views on, different opinions, but it was fascinating to talk to this really sort of charismatic and passionate person, a great talker, and how much common ground we found in the middle. Because if you follow the research from whichever direction, this is where it ends up. The service is nowadays open air in a circle, and you can still see it today in a place called Llan Ilid, which is St. Ilid, the Church of Ilid, who was Joseph of Arimathea. Now, this should be a tourist or visitor site of international proportions. It should be on the United Nations World Heritage Sites list, but there's nothing there at all. So what you have to do is look for Llan Illid Church, L-L-A-N-I-L-I-D, or St. Illid's, as it's still known to this day. Illid was the Welsh name for uh, Joseph of Arimathea, as we'll discuss in a video coming from Galilee, end up with Illid. So when you get to the church, if you find the church, it's no problem. Just to your right, you'll see a little path. Follow that path round and up you go and you it just looks like a hill. When you get to the top, it's amazing. It's a circle, it's like an amphitheatre. You can imagine the people standing around the edges or the congregation in the middle while the great Joseph Arimathea uh, would preach about his first-hand experiences of early Christianity. We're here again. I'm here with Ross Broadstock here. And we've come down the hill from St. Peter's Church and from the preacher's stone there, the sermon stone, traveling across the trails. Now we've come down into the site of, I mean, I have to tell you, Ross, when we were climbing up the hill here, I didn't know what to expect. I thought no, we were going to come to really. the top of a mound and that would be it. But instead, we walked into the site of the earliest known Christian church in the world. Now, if you look around, when we were talking at St. Peter's, we talked about the fact that the original church would have been 
round, not square. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because this was the practice. Now, in the Welsh, you call this the core. A right? core, yeah, it's a circle. That's right. Yeah. A core, a circle, and we know that we see evidence of that in Fortress Babylon, which is now in Cairo, where the original church was round. Oh, wow. And the studies have shown that the the tabernacle. Uh, the, the tent of meeting that was created by Moses in the wilderness was also round and not square. Really? But the teaching is, of course, you know, rectangle, square, all this yeah, stuff. Yeah, I died in thought, yeah. yeah. And uh, that is not true, that actually it was in the round. So the practice in the first century would be to be consistent with that roundness. Now, before I, we're going to talk about this, let me just give a little bit of precedent for that. I've been at the site in Corinth, ancient Corinth, and in ancient Corinth, there's a Greek section and a Roman section, and uh, our guide sh said to us they believed that they had, they had found an artifact in a particular area in Corinth that indicated that a certain building was the synagogue. Okay. And as you walk through the streets of Corinth, you can see that the living quarters were, of course, in the ancient world, very, very small. You'd have yeah, a family yeah, of yeah. four sleeping in a room that was maybe 12 by 12. Right. right. And that was the whole house. Just what you needed to slide down in, right? And so every building in Corinth is square or rectangular. Of course, the Roman buildings are all that way, but so were the Greek buildings, with the exception of one building, which right to the east, the inside of the gate, to the right, there is an oval. That oval is where they found the marking of the synagogue. Wow. So the synagogue was oval. And when you go to the city of ancient city of Capernaum, which is Capernaum by, for everybody else, when you go there, you'll see a site that comes under a building, and they'll tell you that's St. Peter's house. But it wasn't St. Peter's house. Okay. That was the ancient synagogue. There's a worship place. And it's in the round. And then you come out from that, and then you have all the houses built in little rows there, very small houses, maybe even smaller, 10 by 10 maybe. Right, right. And they're in rows there. And then you have the Roman third century synagogue up behind it. For all those of you who have been to Capernaum, you know what I'm talking about. Okay. So here we are, we come to this site, we crest the top of the hill, and this is what we find. Can you give us a little circumnavigation there, Shane, of what we see? And what we see here is a mound that has been constructed, because we're in a flat, yeah. this is yeah. a built mound, and in this built mound, it is in a circle, and even to this day, we find a certain flatness in the middle. Yeah and a circle here so this would have been uh, this would have been consistent with the church now so what's the history of this particular mound what do we know well the, the story is that um if you go through uh, this was the last year of tiberius which would be 37 a.d joseph arimathea and then the, the survivors you want to call it that after the crucifixion what happened to a lot of the people in the near group around jesus that had come to their kinsmen in Britain. If you look at the map of the Mediterranean at the time, Roman Empire, where the persecution was taking place, uh, covered all the areas apart from Britain, because the arrival of Claudius is not till 44, and some people say, Alan Wilson would argue, part of the motivation for the Romans actually invading Britain was to wipe out this early Christianity. But, you know, that's hypothesis. Mm -hmm. What this comes in there is that this is supposed to be typical of the old early Christian or British Apostolic Christian worship place. It says a circle, and you sort of work out, it looks like an entrance over there, mm -hmm. and, and there's a high place then um, where uh, presumably Joseph, or Ilid, as he was called, as in, it's interesting, because you talk about the, the root of the words with Galilee and stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, that makes a lot of sense what you said, because the name Ilid is supposed to come from E of Galilee. As you say, this makes more sense where you say it. Mm -hmm. You yeah, drop he, the Galilee and begins yeah. Iliad then. Okay. Yeah, well, he. Of, well, let's talk about that because <clears> when we talk about he of Galilee, right? So the area the, in, when you see in English you see Galilee, but in the Ivrit or Hebrew, it's Galil. Oh, well, there we are. That makes okay, much Galil. More sense, so, it? Yeah. and quite often what you see is you see that first consonant dropped. So, for instance, when we talk about the the tribe of Ishakar, for instance. In America, they call themselves the Shakari because the e is the e at the end is a possessive, Shakar, right? Right. And the, so, if e Shakar, when you call yourself of that, that first is dropped and you become Shakari. So those who were named after Isaac, Isaac, you would they would drop that and they became known as the Saaka. And so in Georgia, in the Caucasus, they became known as the Saakashvili, the sons of. Saaka or Isaac, 
But in Germany, they became known oh, as I see. the Sachs Sons. Gone. Right, the I is gone from Sa Isaac. I'm with you now. Right. right. Okay, yes. And so here so again, we see. So if we drop <coughs> the G from Galil, we see Galil, he of Galil, Elid, mm -hmm. he, is he of Galil. Oh, well, there we are then. That, that solves that mystery. Because the Galilee to Ilid seems a little bit of a, a slight stretch to me, you know? But mm -hmm. not, not, not impossible, but I didn't understand the link. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. yeah. And of course, the Galil is its own thing. It means what? The circle of the Jordan. You see, it doesn't mean a harp-shaped lake. It means the circle okay. of the Jordan. So actually, the Galil is down where ancient Qumran is now, Kiryat Qumran. It, and it's down there. And this is where John the Baptist baptized. The, the Dead Sea used to come all the way up there at the circle, the mouth of the Jordan, the circle of the Jordan, Galil. Okay. The other side of the Galil is where Sodom and Gomorrah, the five cities of destruction, were found. Right. And they right. were found in condition like Pompeii. Right, we can still see what's going on. Yeah. yeah, and so here, so here, probably. Well, in those days, they say there's always open air worship, and, yeah, and it ties in. This is where it gets <coughs> difficult to know for certain, but the old Druidic uh, faith and ways of worshiping and Trinity and all this kind of stuff seem, at some point, to have intermingled with Druid, uh, with early Christianity. Mm -hmm. And one of the things which um, <coughs> Arthur is supposed to have done is complete the reconcile between the two, between the Druids and the early Christians in the, you know, the 540s, something like that. <clears throat> but in this period, the early period, they would have worshipped outside. And the Druids always worshipped outside. You've got to be seen by God. So you wouldn't worship at night, so you wouldn't worship well, under a roof. Th there are some You'd theories about that. Circle. And it, it ties in with the stone circles as well. You know, well yeah, like, yeah. like Stonehenge. Well, possibly maybe, Stonehenge. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think but that might be an astrological... That yeah, has a calendar, some connotation. Whatever, that yeah, kind of a, cal thing, yeah. a calendar connotation. But just strictly for worship basis. But we know, like this. we know now scientifically that to walk on soil barefooted mm, is yeah, to, grounding, to yeah. ground yeah. yourself, right? And mm -hmm. to ground yourself, mm -hmm. and by grounding yourself, you take the, all that static electricity that's built up in the body and, and it mm. releases. So there is something to the organicness, if you will, of that outdoor worship. And of course, the Druids are completely misunderstood. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, look, the myth in the myth in the United States, give an idea what people think about the Celtic people and the think. Druids, right? <coughs> Druids were tree-worshipping human sacrificers, yeah, yeah, and yeah. the Celtic people were people who used to run around naked mm -hmm. and attack people Blue stark paint. naked and yeah, scream yeah. and behead all their neighbors, mm -hmm. right? I mean, this is the story you get mm -hmm. with, no, with no other justification, no other, you know, discussion. Well, the Roman accounts are do it. What's really frustrating is people always refer to the Roman accounts of everything. But most of the Roman accounts which describe Druids, there's about 12 full accounts, none of those people had ever been to Britain. They had they, no experience at all. The only, uh, one of the writings had some experience through his father having been a commander on Julius Caesar's campaign when he got kicked out of Britain, and he wrote some soldiers' tales, and, and his son rewrote them. Apart from that, none of those people have been any first-hand experience at all. And that's the only historical references people ever use. But what we do see But they, they say the British own record is nothing like that at all. Nothing at no, all. Nothing like it's that. about the eternity of the soul and it's about uh, you know, life being a journey of knowledge and understanding and, and faith and these kind of things. Well, Shane and I have talked <clears> a little bit about the Druid uh, stuff and Shane has contributed great uh, understanding. But you know, there's a couple of critical points. One is the eternity of the soul. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, so, that's a massive point. Yes. Yeah. So when you talk about a, a, an essential concept, right? That's yeah. an essential theological concept yes. that is totally Im, Im, embossed, if you will, in the Christian yes. or in the in the Hebraic faith. Yes. And the Romans do refer to that because this is why they they were always astounded how. Uh, fearless the warriors were because they seemed to have a complete disdain for death because all they would do is put them on the next step of their uh, process and if they had a good death it gets you a bit further up you know a little yeah. bit similar to the Hindu uh, moving up to the levels you know with mm -hmm. the, the reincarnation your soul mm -hmm. you can't kill that mm -hmm. and stab away you know and this, this was what's totally so demoralizing for the Roman soldiers we're up against that yeah and because it's, it's a fearlessness it's a fearlessness yes. yeah and also my understanding of the Druidism is that there was a concept of vicarious atonement Mm, mm, that you could yes. be atoned, you could be atoned by a vicarious means. Yes, yes, yes. Well, this is where you get into the... Um, it, I think it's, there's a couple of stages leading up to that, is that if you were... If, say you've done a capital crime, like killing someone or something, and you handed yourself in voluntarily... Sorry, voluntarily handed yourself in and confessed, that was a good thing. You could be executed, but your soul would be released. Uh, if you were captured without... Uh, confessing or surrendering, you know, you have to be dragged in, if you like, and go through a trial, then you might well have a gruesome death and your soul will be sort of damned. Mm. Where the vicarious thing comes in, and the story with Jesus ties in, so was so easily accepted by the Druids, or, I mean, 
as well is that story ties in so well that in this instance uh, Jesus had not done the supposed crimes but he still handed himself in and taken the punishment that the criminals should have done. So this is, when mm -hmm. it's, this is where it becomes an easier concept for them to adopt. It's not exactly mm -hmm. the same, mm -hmm. but I think it might be what we were alluding to. Yeah, perhaps. it's very close. Now, there's also <coughs> discussion about whether or not the Druids were Jews or yes, of yes. the tribe of Judah. Now, is there anything in the record concerning Well, that? this is the big thing. The 500 BC uh, migration to here is known. It was always taught in the schools. It's always there, accepted for hundreds of years that this is the lost tribes. As Al Wilson's joke, they never lost, they knew exactly where they were, but right. this is where they came. And this is why, after the crucifixion, whatever your view of events there, if you're fleeing from Roman persecution, you go to where your kindred people are. Right. This is yes, where sure. the kindred people already were. And this mm -hmm. is where we tie into those things. I was asking you more about SN and things like that, because they're working out exactly how the Druids tie in with the Christian is a difficult thing, you know, it's not something I'm an expert in at all, you know, it's uh, well, that's, that's you know, the area that's yeah. interesting. And you have some, well, there's a couple of things that took place there, if you will, because there is a couple of migrations of Jews mm. that it, it stems from the two brothers, because you have Judah the father, and he had twin sons, Zara and Ferez. Now, Zara was, he, he broke the matrix, he was the first one to break the matrix, i.e., his hand came out. And the midwives tied a red oh, string with you now, with the, before around the, board, the right, right hand. So you know who's the first born, right? Okay. Then the, head, the hand withdrew and Ferez was born. Well, traditionally they are marked in symbolism as the red rampant lion okay. for the house of Zara and the golden rampant lion for the house of Ferez. Right. Okay? So it's very possible that there was this house of Zara which had actually populated Cadiz, Spain, and up the Ebro or Hebrew River, if you will, named after a bear uh, in, in central Spain. And so you have the house of Zara already in Spain. <clears throat> and so it would it would have been very easy for this house to have trans mm -hmm. transferred up in, into the Well, in the migration the story, they do talk about, um, you know, some obviously going to Etrusca and Rome and that the Italian connection, but also some stopping off in Spain. Now, whether or not they joined people who were already there, which would fit in with what you're saying, or they were the first day, whatever. Because it always amuses me when people say, well, I've had my DNA tested and I've got some Italian in me or I've got some Spanish in me. And it's like, no, no, you've probably got the ancient Assyrian in you. And some went there <laughs> right. and some went here and right. some went there. It's the right. same way, there's people right. with the same DNA as me living in New Zealand. I don't have New Zealand blood in me. Right, you right. You know, or America. I don't have right. American blood in me. Just because right, right, you right, find sure. the DNA in other places. It's, like, it's, it's not a time stamp on DNA, is there? You know, it's the, That's the right. sequence is difficult to work out. Yeah. And connections are easier to spot. But it, so that it, would be a possible connection. Yeah. yeah. In this document that we publish <coughs> in this effort, okay. there's a 29th chapter to the book of Acts. Yes, this is interesting, isn't it? Yes. Okay, and so this 29th chapter, which is a controversial chapter. Very controversial, yeah. But it was, the, it's called the Sonini Manuscript. Sonini uh, apparently found this manuscript in the Hagia Sophia in yeah, Constantinople. Constantinople yes, he yeah. brings it back. The French Revolution is on. He fear for, fears for his life. So he sequesters the manuscript in Ireland from the 1789, 1785, until it is finally translated into English in 1887. Then for the first time they find out there's a 29th chapter of the book of Acts. Right. And in this book it says that Paul meets the Druids yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and the Druids tell him, we are of the house of Judah. Yes, yes. And he gives them a kiss of peace and then moves on. Now, when we see these concepts, and so this is this is kind of the thing you have the kind of evidence that we look to to try to determine. Okay. Is there yeah. is there anything here? Because oh, plenty, isn't there? Yeah. And yeah. The sure. lion I was telling you about the, the lion stone and stuff. Yeah. Oh, the lion. Like the Judah. You know the lion. The oh, the lion of Judah. Judah. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you're talking about the lion that pointed to Saint Peter's Church, right? Uh, oh, no, it, it points to, to the to the glow. Yeah, to the yeah. ark. Yeah. To the ark of the covenant. Yeah. And so we, we're, of course, we're in Wales, so we can't go and see the tomb of Jeremiah that is, you know, allegedly to be in Ireland. Tomb of yeah, I don't know about that one. Yeah. And you know, allegedly he brought the pillow over, the Jacob's pillow, which is oh, the, the stone of scone, yeah, which yeah. ended up in Scotland, yeah. Right. And so we have these kinds of things, these kind of connections, but it gives us an indication that there were, of course, people trans coming in here, 500 BC. Oh, definitely. 600, definitely, 700 definitely, BC. Definitely. And On the tin trade and everything, there was a lot of going way back. Way you back. Know, at least 1500 BC, people were trading tin uh, goods. You know, You've, there's all sorts of stuff. Mm -hmm. Massive amount of travel going on. It was also the, the Druidic belief system that it was only a temporary movement for a coming Messiah 
which uh, when Christi early Christianity made his way into Britain was then the, the, the transition from the Druidic sy system of belief into that apostolic Christianity which you were mentioning earlier Ross that King Arthur reconciled both of them together yeah yeah, yeah that's, that seems to be there's still um, the difficulty of course he had as well was by that stage of course you had the Roman influence coming in as well so you try to reconcile everything it gets more, more tricky for him isn't it yeah. and whilst we were also in Caerphilly Castle yesterday Dr <clears throat> Pigeon there was also the the coat of arms of the the, the Ferez and and Zara. Oh, the, the lions, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we saw both yeah, the yeah. red rampant lion and the golden rampant lion on the yeah. coat of arms inside the castle. I think they, do they say that's Llewellyn, I think, don't they, something like that? Yeah. And so, Which is the lion, yeah. But, but the thing is, is, when you look at this, what you don't see is you don't see barbarism. Oh, what you don't no. see no, no, is no. you don't see the worship of Ishtar. You don't see Hinduism. You don't see no. Buddhism. You don't see Taoism. You don't see Shintoism or Confucianism. You see this idea of an eternal soul, and you see this idea of vicarious atonement, right? Mm -hmm. And we see, a, and a condition of the soul after death, right? Mm -hmm. That you could be subject to damnation, or you could be subject to eternal redemption, right? When you're in, talking, in to, some ways, yeah, I think there's more in case you. you it is well, I mean, it's similar. I don't think it is the same, but it's got similar. Some of the essence is similar to Hinduism, and the idea is you, 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 you keep, your soul keeps returning in a new living being, so you can go down the evolutionary train if you like to a slug or something and come back as a <laughs> high level person yeah, well, I don't know. know I mean I'm not an expert on Druidism but it's just the reading I've, I've done on that they seem to have a reincarnation yeah. view of an yeah, eternal yeah, and, and, and believe, spirit. believe it or not there was some reincarnation in fact there is aspects of Judaism that still embrace reincarnation okay. we in the, in the in the New Testament gospel you have this phrase that appears in the epistle of the Hebrews to the Hebrews that says a man is appointed once to die and then to face judgment right so it gives you an idea that the soul is one, it's an individual thing, and you have one process on earth. And that's reinforced in the book of Four Ezra as well, talking about what happens on earth in this lifetime and what the, what the soul faces afterwards. Mm -hmm. But it is true that an unrepentant soul is going to face damnation. The, you know, the, the, the soul that says, I didn't do it, try me. Yes, yeah, repentance is important, yes. But yes. The, the soul that's repentant and turns himself in, that soul is going to have redemption, right? Yes. But yes. at any rate, so as we stand here talking about these interesting concepts, it's very obvious to me that this was a man-built area mm -hmm. and that it was built in a circle. And for all we know, because this is soft soil, this may have accumulated and this may have been much deeper. Yeah, good point, yeah. Right? Yeah. And the have... trees are very new, as we were commenting. Yeah. And uh, other examples uh, of Christian cause would, would absolutely suggest that too. I hate the fact that he gets planted over. Yeah. yeah, 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 and it's supposed to be a, a circle of stones around you as well, possibly. We we'll be visit Kalian very soon, which is a, a perfect example of, of what a Christian core in early Christianity would have looked like. But this would have been a Christian core, and we, the the interesting amount, the history that you understand about this place huh. is that this place is circa 36, 37 years. Yeah, or shortly after, yes. Yeah. And that it was created by Joseph of Arimathea. Yes, or, or yes, yes. Well, the name, the name and the church across there. Again, it's St. Illid's Church. It's still Saint, called St. Illid's Church to this Saint, day. Yeah, St. Illid. So you, yeah. and Illid, of course, is taken from the man of Galilee. Yes. Which would have been Joseph of Arimathea. Exactly, yes. And there's, there's numerous references for that. I mean, absolute numerous references of Joseph coming here and everything. The only confusion has been this, uh, you know, the Glastonbury hoax. Yeah, which the Glastonbury hoax. Which is, which is maddening. It was exposed about 900 years ago. They need to build a new roof. They needed money. They transported stories in, you know. They, they tried to... They, they, they dig up some bodies and try to say it was Arthur. They tried to take the Joseph Arimathea. The church is founded in like 940 something, and they're claiming people were buried there 900 years before the church even existed. It was a swamp. It wasn't an island, you know. It's, uh, anyway, interesting. It's, no, right, a we'll continue point our was. discussion. <laughs> we'll continue our discussion when we get to some of the other sites. The middle now, mate. Yes. What are you thinking there? This would be the spot for the preaching. Yeah. So we're standing here in the middle of this of the core here. And so we, we can see a natural entrance that came up this way. Yep. And so this was, I think, probably a little bit deeper. There's sediment here on top, and of course, yeah, you it's know, very soft, uh, isn't it? Landfill. But so this was probably lower. But so the people would come in. Now, typically, the way it worked is you would have the men come in, and then the women would fill around the periphery. Because, of course, it was not a woman's place to talk in the, in the Kehila. But then the, it would be, the teaching would be, the common practice of the teaching would be 
you know you would have a you'd have a probably a torah reading but what would take place fundamentally would be the teaching of the gospel so the gospel message would be presented now here joseph of arimathea saint ilid would be standing here saying you know i knew him i watched him these are the events that occurred i took his body down from the cross i put him in the tomb and after i put him in the tomb these three ladies who are standing here with me miriam miriam and miriam were there as witnesses they came to the tomb the tomb was empty the roman soldiers that were watching the tomb were executed because they had seen nothing and it was after that that we had this this glorious ascension proved when he walked among us again and he walked among us for 40 days and we talked with him and we ate with him and we shared with him and at the end of the 40 days his ascension on this earth was done and he ascended from this earth and the testimony was weak and the testimony was wimpy and the testimony was full of cowardice and fear and all of his disciples who were called to be bold and brave hid in rooms in Jerusalem saying we don't know him we don't know him we don't know him until he came to them and said look I'm going to leave and then this Holy Spirit is going to come upon you and it will come upon you and then you will be bold then you go to Jerusalem and you go to Samaria and then you go to the very ends of the earth to give this message and so now here I am and of course we know that what took place in Jerusalem was miraculous but these Herodians that call themselves Jews these Benjamites who call themselves Jews these Jews who call themselves Levites despised the man they killed the man they rejected their king and they told us should we proclaim his name in public again that they would kill us too and James the Just was beheaded and some of the other teachers were beheaded and murdered and so we left why do we leave because I know these aisles I've been here many times and I come back here and this is where I have come back and this is where we have gathered and so this is where we are and so we have formed in the synagogue where we will learn the teaching we will learn the teaching of Moshe we will learn the words of the prophets we will learn the words of David we will learn the words of Solomon and importantly I will impart to you the words of Yahushua HaMashiach well, I have to say this the site itself I found um, very spiritual very emotional place and with the power of uh, Dr. Pigeon's uh, preaching as well it was uh, amazingly spiritual place and I highly recommend it uh, please go and say, look for uh, St. Iliad's on a map near Bridge End in South Wales. And see what you think. And there'll be more from Britain's Hidden History soon and from Dr. Stephen Pigeon.